The War of 1812 is not a well-known one, certainly outside of North America, and even there it is often mixed up with the Revolutionary War. It is often, and frankly quite accurately, described as a Second War of Independence, but the strategic situation was far different. Firstly, the USA was now an independent country, with its own laws and constitution, although a lot of the details in the organisation of the nation had not been fully worked out, in particular the thorny issue of the balance between state and federal power. The new country had huge potential, but it was geographically and politically isolated. The main European powers hardly considered it, and the British regarded it with positive disdain. Their huge navy controlled the Atlantic, and treated Americans in a way they would never do to a nation they regarded as being equally valid. The presence of the colonies of British North America, as Canada was then known, was a constant source of irritation for more militant American politicians. British North America had a population at the time of only about half a million. The colonies were seriously underdeveloped and were completely dependent on the mother country for goods and services. They couldn't even guarantee to be able to feed themselves every year. The United States, on the hand, had a population of nearly 8 million. It was bold, dynamic and keen to expand ever deeper into the continent. It might be thought that, outnumbered by over 15 to 1, and with a major war against the French on their hands, the British would be keen to avoid any possibility of conflict. But in fact they instituted a series of very high-handed policies towards their former colony, harassing American merchant shipping, impressing sailors on American ships they considered to be British, blocking American exports into Europe as part of their war with the French, and so on. Slowly, a pro-war faction gained ground in the US Senate, motivated by hatred of British domination and a greed for Canadian and Indian land. Too late, the British realised just how strong these feelings were running in the Republic. They frantically moderated their policies, but it was too late. On June 18th, 1812, the United States made its first ever declaration of war. The focus of the War of 1812 was the lakes and waterways on the Canadian-American border. The Napoleonic Wars were then at their height and there were few British reinforcements available for North America. Guided by the Republican philosophy of Thomas Jefferson, the United States had a very small and under-equipped army. In lieu of regular troops, both sides had to make do with large numbers of poorly trained, poorly equipped and often dubiously motivated militia. The battles of the War of 1812 were fought with a preponderance of infantry. Most of the US-Canadian border was still virgin forest and suitable for mounted operations. Both sides had only as few cavalry units and they were mostly employed for scouting and courier work. Artillery was a luxury. It was an expensive arm to raise, maintain and especially to transport across the then terrible roads. The large amount of woodland significantly hampered its deployment and its effectiveness. Illustrations and films of this conflict invariably depict soldiers in pristine red and blue uniforms. The reality is much more mundane. The blue wool used to make American uniforms had to be imported, ironically enough, from Britain. With the outbreak of war, that source of supply was obviously cut off, and American quartermasters were soon forced to start issuing uniforms in dark brown, then light brown, and eventually grey. There was enough blue cloth for the few artillery and cavalry units, but only for seven of the infantry regiments. As the army was expanded rapidly during the war, this soon made a blue-clad American a very rare sight. At Lundy's Lane, all but one of the American infantry units was in grey, and one New York State Militia cavalry unit was in red. Officially, all British troops were clad in scarlet, which is actually a very deep orange rather than red, but the British were in even direst straits for uniforms than the Americans. Canada had no native textile industry and all uniforms had to be imported. There were barely enough red coats for the regulars and as an interim measure most of the fencible militia units were instead dressed in green which was appropriate because like a high proportion of the British Army in Canada most of them were trained light infantry which traditionally wore green. The sedentary militia drilled only twice a year and called up only upon direct invasion of their home areas started with no uniforms at all. They were told to report for duty wearing dark civilian clothing and to avoid grey, which was commonly used by the Americans. The only uniform issues some received were white armbands to identify them as the King's men. As the war progressed, Fensible Militia was issued scarlet uniforms as they became available, and sedentary units steadily issued with green. 
It was from such unlikely materials that the largest and bloodiest battle ever fought in Canada was crafted. Lundy's Lane was also the one where the two sides were the most evenly matched. The British had an overall numerical advantage of about 4-3, to three, and they were defending ground of their own choosing. Against that, their reinforcements arrived rather later on average, and their extra numbers were mostly made of some decidedly unreliable militia. The Americans also had marginally better equipment, their slightly fewer but rather bigger cannon, and initially at least an element of surprise. Lundy's Lane was a truly horrific battle, and all who took part in it were forever scarred by the experience. Fought within earshot of Niagara Falls, it started about 6pm and went on into the early hours of the following day. It was fought in midsummer on the night of a full moon, but it was also completely overcast, which lent the battle a surreal, otherworldly appearance. It was not a large battle, even by contemporary standards, about 6,500 participants, and not all were present for all of it, but it was a very fiercely contested struggle. The two sides essentially fought each other into the ground, and at the end of it, over 1,800 of them were casualties. The Battle of Lundy's Lane was the culmination of the American 1814 Niagara Campaign. Previous American attempts to conquer Canada in the War of 1812 had been stymied by a combination of spirited resistance, inadequate resources and indifferent leadership. Now, with the Napoleonic Wars in Europe winding down, it was essential that Canada should fall before the British could intervene with massive reinforcements. Accordingly, the US appointed new commanders, superior training programmes were instituted and a more comprehensive invasion plan formulated. The new American commander was Major General Jacob Brown, a self-made Pennsylvanian pioneer successful in many spheres of life. He farmed, built bridges and roads, was elected to public office and apparently was a very diligent smuggler. He is not well known to the modern American public, but he deserves to be. To put his achievements into perspective, he fought more battles against the British than Washington did, and he won a high proportion of them as well. The idea was for an American army to form a bridgehead on the Niagara Peninsula, securing an area to allow for reinforcements and supplies to be moved across by the US Lake Ontario Squadron. The reinforced army would then sweep up the peninsula, the ultimate target being the key British encampment at Burlington Heights. Once this had been occupied, British supply lines would be cut and both York and Kingston would be vulnerable to attack. The capture of either would surely lead to the fall of Upper Canada. At first, all went well. Brown successfully led the revitalised American army across the St Lawrence River and quickly seized Fort Erie on the southern part of the peninsula. This was a major blow for the British, who had expected the fort to be able to hold out for some time. The British commander on the Niagara Peninsula, Major General Riel, did not know the fort had fallen and therefore believed a good proportion of the US Army was still investing it. He moved to probe the American bridgehead, but badly underestimated its strength and determination. The first US brigade counterattacked, and the result was a sprawling clash at Chippewa. Riel was caught not fully deployed, and in a fierce exchange of fire was forced to retreat. This was an even more severe blow for the British. For the first time, regular US infantry had stood and traded volleys successfully with their vaunted British counterparts. The result of the battle did not all go well, and realising now just how heavily outnumbered he was, Real withdrew further up the peninsula. Then things began to go wrong for the Americans. The main British defensive position on the border, Fort George, was far too strong to be stormed, and Brown's army lacked the heavy artillery to besiege it. He did not even have the numbers to successfully invest it. More seriously, the Navy did not turn up with the reinforcements and the supplies they were supposed to transport. With American attacks to the east against Montreal having stalled, the British would soon be able to pour reinforcements into the Niagara Peninsula. Brown called a council of war to decide on a course of action. The commander of his first brigade was Brigadier General Winfield Scott. Scott was a tall, handsome, athletic, regular soldier with a particular skill for training and a very bold, aggressive nature. He argued that to withdraw now would be very bad for morale, particularly after the sterling success at Chippewa. Victories on land had been few and far between for the Republic, and to tamely retreat after winning one would not go over well with either the American public or the government in Washington. The commander of the 2nd Brigade, Brigadier General Eliza Ripley, favoured a withdrawal. Pushing up the peninsula would give the British ample time both to concentrate and to choose a suitable defensive position. 
the Americans would be fighting on ground of their opponents choosing, and they were bound to be outnumbered. Even if they won against the odds, the US Army was patently too small to occupy the entire peninsula, and the failure of the Navy to provide supplies meant they would be unable to sustain themselves in Canada for very long. The commander of the small 3rd Militia Brigade, Peter D. Porter, sided with Scott. A rabid supporter of the war, his main concern was to uphold the honour of his Pennsylvania militiamen and not to be overshadowed by the regulars. Retreat would not have looked good on that front. Brown, himself a bold energetic commander, who did not like Ripley over much, was heartened by this display of bravado and sided with Scott, even though the advance was, at the least, not completely strategically sound. The temptation to catch and overwhelm the outnumbered rail was too much. He duly ordered the 1st Brigade to lead the army forward. Lundy's Lane was a strategic junction of two of the few major roads on the Niagara Peninsula and a British stopgap position. Riel had originally decided to abandon it and fall back to a new position at Twenty Mile Creek, but his superior, Lieutenant General Gordon Drummond, was racing into the Niagara Peninsula with hefty reinforcements. Drummond cancelled this movement, instructed Riel to call out the militia and ordered a reconcentration at Lundy's Lane. By late July 27th, Riel's troops were preparing to bivouac on or around the hill overlooking the crossroads at Lundy's Lane. Drummond's second column was 15 miles to the north, and a third column, under a Colonel Hercules Scott, was approaching from the west. A reserve, the Royal Scots Regiment, were behind Drummond. The British force was therefore still well strung out when Winfield Scott's 1st US Brigade hove into view from the road and the woods to the south. It was 5pm. Brown had made an uncharacteristic mistake. He neglected to move his mounted troops forward to scout out the American advance. If he had, they would certainly have spotted that Riel was no longer retreating. Consequently, Scott was completely surprised to find the British dug in along a small ridgeline about 50 feet above the surrounding cultivated fields. A sweep of the telescope showed that the British were present in some numbers, but the dead ground behind the hill and the already deteriorating visibility did not fully reveal to Scott just how badly outnumbered he was. The unexpected presence of the British placed Scott in a bit of a quandary. To attack an undetermined but known to be large enemy force uphill in a piecemeal fashion was against all military dictums, but against that he could see that the British were setting up bivouacs and were obviously not expecting to be attacked this late in the day. Besides, if he were to retreat it would not only dishearten his own men, but might completely panic Ripley's 2nd Brigade moving up behind them. Given Scott's bold, competitive nature, it should come as no surprise that he decided to make a risky attack, hoping that dash and aggression would make up for lack of numbers. Scott might have been an overly aggressive commander, but he was not an unskilled one. As he formed his brigade for a frontal assault, he sent one of his four infantry regiments, Jessup's 25th, on a long wide flanking movement through some woods on his right, from where it would be able to attack the British left wing. Scott formed the rest of his brigade and mounted a full-scale frontal assault on the British guns dug in at the base of the hill. This met with a surprising amount of success, partly because the British were not expecting an attack and partly because the same poor visibility meant they did not realise just how few Americans there were. Nonetheless, the British rallied an increasingly effective fire, particularly from their artillery, carefully concentrated in a graveyard at the top of a low rise, began whittling down Scott's modest force. However, at this juncture, Jessup's 25th Regiment charged out from the woods, scattered the incorporated militia on the British left flank, and captured hundreds of wounded redcoats, including Reel, who had been hit in the arm, but had refused to leave the field to have the wound treated. The situation looked bad for the British, but their reinforcements were arriving, and Jessup was unable to exploit his success. Scott's command began to crumble under an increasing weight of shot, but just in time Ripley's 2nd Brigade arrived to shore up the US line. Jacob Brown asked the commander of the 21st Regiment, one James Miller, if he could take the British artillery pieces dominating the battlefield from the formidable hill overlooking the crossroads. Miller's laconic reply to this demanding request, I'll try, sir, has become part of US Army folklore. The 21st promptly stormed the hill and captured the guns at Bayonet Point. By now both commanding generals were on the field, but both were almost immediately wounded. Combined with the degradation of command and control caused by the rapidly deteriorating visibility, the battle turned into a brutal slugfest. 
As regiments arrived, they were immediately thrown into a series of assaults and counter-assaults for control of the hill. Any tactical advantage they achieved was only by chance. None of the commanders knew what was going on beyond their immediate position. Three times exhausted British troops attempted to storm the hill, and then each time somehow the threadbare American units repelled them. Drummond has been much criticised for this. The British had a preponderance of light infantry, but he made no use of their skills to develop the situation and weaken the American line prior to an assault. On the other hand, by this stage of the battle it was very dark, and it is doubtful light infantry would have been able to be particularly effective. Besides, deploying his light infantry in skirmish order would have been difficult and further lessened his ability to control their actions. As it was, confusion reigned. On several occasions both sides fired at their own troops thinking they were the enemy. At the end, hostile troops could only be seen by the flash of their own musket discharges. Eventually Ripley, now in command, realised he could not maintain his position, but determined to drag away the captured British guns. Unfortunately, most of the limbers and horses had been lost, and only one could be secured. But just before this could happen, British forces made one last counter-attack and recaptured the guns. The battle petered out in the early hours of the morning. Neither side broke, they just collapsed from exhaustion. Allegedly, at the end, Ripley could find only 300 men capable of standing. The British were in no better shape. Their reinforcements had forced march the whole of the hot summer's day and were exhausted. After daybreak, Ripley slowly withdrew what remained of the US Army. The British were in no condition to pursue them. The wounded Brown was furious that Ripley had withdrawn, and ordered him to form up the army at daybreak and return to the attack. Ripley could only muster about 1,500 exhausted troops, but duly obeyed. When he arrived at Lundy's Lane, Ripley saw that at least 2,000 British soldiers were posted on the heights, and realising there was no possibility of a successful attack, he withdrew. Both sides claimed victory, but many on both sides privately thought they had been defeated. Tactically, the battle was a draw, with both sides suffering almost identical casualties. Strategically, though, Lundy's Lane was a British victory, as the US Army was prevented from continuing its objective of seizing the Niagara Peninsula. Brown withdrew his force to Fort Erie, which he successfully held against a siege and a disastrous storming attempt. With the coming of winter, he destroyed the fort and withdrew back into the USA. For political reasons, all the main participants of the battle were lauded by their respective countries. Jacob Brown was awarded a Congressional Gold Medal, the forerunner of the Congressional Medal of Honor, and after the war he was made Commanding General of the entire US Army. Winfield Scott continued in the US Army, eventually becoming Commanding General himself in 1841. He served as the main military advisor for seven presidents and developed the Anaconda Plan that was used to defeat the Confederacy in the Civil War. Eliza Ripley demanded a court-martial in response to what he considered to be slurs by Brown, but the Senate stopped proceedings after the first witness. He retired from the army in 1820 and served as a representative for Louisiana. Peter B. Porter continued his political career after the war ended, eventually becoming Secretary of State for War in 1828. Gordon Drummond continued as Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada and eventually became Governor General of Canada, before being recalled to England where he was knighted. He was made a full general in 1825 and continued on the active list for another 25 years, although he never saw active duty again. Phineas Real was payrolled in December of 1814 and after the war became Governor General of Grenada. Although he remained in the army, he was pretty much semi-retired for the rest of his life. The battlefield of Lundy's Lane is now completely urbanised, but the Niagara Falls History Museum nearby incorporates the old Lundy's Lane Historical Museum and has many exhibits relevant to the battle.